Good morning, everyone. I hope the worship service will bless you this morning. I would like to draw your attention to one announcement uh, concerning the Sacrament of Holy Communion, which will be celebrated on Sunday, November the 29th, which is the first Sunday in Advent. We're there almost already. And in keeping with our COVID protocols, we won't be able to have communion elements that have been handled by someone else. So if you would be kind enough, um, if you come that Sunday, to please bring a piece of bread and some grape juice or wine from your own home in whatever way you feel that you can transport it here. Uh, some people might want to use a, a grape juice box, for instance. And it is preferred that it be grape juice because it represents the blood of Christ or red wine. But if not, whatever you're able to bring and um, everyone will remain seated for communion and I'll ask everyone when to partake. So if you would please uh, read that announcement over for communion on Sunday, November the 29th, the first Sunday in Advent. Thank you. Please stand. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. 
God, who gives us every good gift, we praise you. Christ, who showers us with grace, we glorify you. Holy Spirit, who strengthens and inspires us, we worship you. Let us pray. Transforming God, you take the night and give us day. You take our strife and give us peace. You take our sadness and give us joy. You take our fear and give us courage. You take death and give us new life. You give grace beyond all expectation. You give love beyond all imagination. You give and you give and you give. So we praise and adore you as creator, Christ and Holy Spirit, one God, three in one, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Prayer of Confession, let us pray. Compassionate and giving God, you have given us so much, but we have wasted your gifts. We have failed to use what you have given us for our own good and the good of others. We have filled our days with things that do not matter. We have expended our energy on tasks that lead nowhere. We seek simple answers to complex issues. We refuse to sacrifice our personal comfort for a higher goal. Forgive us, O oh Lord. By your Holy Spirit, inspire us to reach higher and dig deeper. Through Christ our Savior, we pray. Amen. Neither death nor life nor things present, nor things to come, can separate us from the love of God. When we repent, our sin does not separate us from God. In Christ you are forgiven. Amen. A reading from the book of Judges, hear the word of God. The Israelites again 
did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. After he had died, so the Lord sold him into the hand of King Javan of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harasheth ha -Goim. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron and had oppressed the Israelites cruelly for 20 years. At that time, Deborah, a prophetess, wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, son of Abinom, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, go, take position at Mount Tabor, bringing 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtali and the tribe of Zebulun. I will draw out Sisera, the general of Javan's army, to meet you by the Wadi Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. A reading from the first letter to Thessalonians, hear the word of God. Now, concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them, as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then, let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Hear the word of God. The parable of the talents. Jesus said, For it is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each one according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You've been trustworthy in a few things. 
I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow, and I gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him, and give it to the one with the ten talents. For, for to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The late actor Catherine Hepburn was known for her witty sayings. She once said, life is hard, after all, it kills you. And she also said, old age is not for sissies. Catherine Hepburn was a woman who tried to face life without fear. The saddest and the least productive emotion in life is fear. Now, don't get me wrong. It's a good thing to be afraid of guns and grizzly bears and icy roads and ax murderers. That kind of fear keeps you alive. But I'm talking about fear as a general approach to life. For some people, fear is their overriding daily emotion. They refuse to deal with anything new or anything unfamiliar out of fear. They refuse to take any kind of risk out of fear. Fear as a general approach to life leads only to regret and lost opportunities. It also leads to a very selfish life where one is focused primarily on oneself and one's security. In our gospel lesson for this morning, the parable of the talents, this word jumps out at me, fear. Another word that jumps out at me is entrust. A man entrusted his slaves with his money. Jesus said, a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. The property in the, in the parable is referred to as talents. And a talent in the ancient world was a weight of gold or silver or copper. The slave to whom the master entrusted five talents invested the money and made five more talents. The slave to whom the master had entrusted two talents invested the money and made two more talents. But the slave to whom he had entrusted one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and buried it. After a long time, the master returned from his journey and asked the slaves to account for what they had done with the money that he had entrusted them with. Well, the master praised the two slaves who had invested the money and made more money. Well done, good and trustworthy slaves, he said to them. But the one who had buried his one talent in the ground, the master said to him, you wicked and lazy slave. Now, why did the master praise those who had invested the money and made more money and criticize the one who saved the money? Is this parable an endorsement of those who play the stock market and an indictment of those who choose to save their money? No, I think 
the message of the parable hinges on the two words, fear and entrust. I think that we can assume that the master in the parable represents God and the slaves represent us, God's servants. The master entrusted the slaves with his money. God entrusts us with many, many things. He created this beautiful world and entrusts us to look after it. God entrusted us when we were born with our own personality, our own gifts, our own talents. And he expects us to use those gifts and talents for good. What will we do with what God has entrusted us? Will we take a risk as the slaves did when they invested the money? Investment always involves a risk. It can go either way, loss or gain. Will we risk our own safety for the good of the world and God's people? Will we take on new ideas and new ways of thinking even though we're not certain if they will bring good or ill? Will we start a new project even though we don't know if it's going to be successful or not? Or will we be like the slave who buried his talent? Will we sit frozen in fear, refusing to do anything because we're afraid of the risk, afraid that our efforts might fail? This brings me to the second key word in the parable, fear. The master who represents God criticized the slave who buried his one talent because his chief motivation was fear. His general approach to life was fear. And as I said, fear is the saddest and the least productive emotion in life. I assert, sadly, that 90% of Presbyterian congregations live like this slave who buried his talent in the ground. Most congregations in the Presbyterian Church are far, far too motivated by fear. Fear of the church closing, fear of not having enough money to pay the bills, fear of offending someone because they might leave the church. And as a result, Presbyterian congregations refuse to do anything that involves risk because of fear. Most congregations of any denomination are extremely risk averse. We are born risk averse. It's natural for us to be that way. But I believe that this is one of the main reasons that the church is failing. The church is too risk averse. And as a result, Everything is safe and stable and comfortable for the church members, yet spiritual growth is stunted. The community outside isn't being served as it should because spiritual growth and service require risk. Spiritual growth requires us to accept new ideas, new ways of doing things, to admit that maybe the way we thought in the past wasn't always the right way to look at the world in a new way. And that's far too scary for most of us. Too much risk, we won't do it. Service to others requires us to go out on a limb for someone. That is what service to others is. Go out on a limb for the sake of somebody else. And we refuse to do that because we're far too concerned about preserving our own comfort and safety. You know, even a simple thing like this we refuse to do. Someone is being unjustly treated, they're being criticized unjustly, terrible things are being done to them, maybe it's in your family group or maybe it's in your church, and you refuse to even speak up in defense of that person because you're afraid of the blowback on yourself. Too much risk, I won't do it. So we just let the person suffer and tell ourselves that, oh well, I just can't get involved. We all know stories of people that are being beaten up on the street 
and everybody just stands and watches. Nobody even phones the police, let alone try to intervene and help. Why? Because it's too much risk. We don't want to get involved. Those whose main preoccupation is their own comfort and safety find ways to justify their position. And one of them is to find fault with those who are taking risks. The slave buried his master's money and he said, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you didn't sow, gathering where you didn't scatter, so was, I was afraid and I hid your talent in the ground. Well, those criticisms of the master might very well have been true, but how did that justify what he had done? We use the criticism of others to justify our own inaction. Those who are risk averse are like this slave, great at pointing out everybody else's faults, but not particularly good at doing anything themselves. You know, there are two things that we can do in life. We can try to address a problem and probably make mistakes along the way because we're human and imperfect. Nobody ever addressed a problem without making mistakes. Or we can sit on our rears and do nothing because we're too afraid and all the while point out all the mistakes of those who are trying to do something. Risk averse people won't do anything to try to solve a problem because they're afraid they'll make a mistake. They're afraid they might fail. They're afraid they might be criticized or they're afraid they might offend somebody. Yet their inaction doesn't prevent them from self-righteously pointing out the mistakes of all those who are trying to solve the problem. When we try to do anything new or creative or innovative or just try to even defend some sort of position, we're always going to make mistakes. You will never get it perfect. Nobody on the face of this earth ever gets it perfect. And there will be those who will delight in pointing out all your mistakes. Some will say you went too far. Others will say you didn't go far enough. Some will say you offended too many people. Others will say you were too nice. Some will say you didn't explain things well enough and others will say they got sick of listening to all of your explanations. If you really listened to the criticisms that are leveled at you when you try to do something, you would think that you were two people because one person will say one thing about you and the other will say the exact opposite. Yet, how do you want to live your life? Do you want to play it safe, take no risks, and have a comfortable and secure life, but not accomplish a heck of a lot? Or do you want to take risks, try to do something? Maybe you'll succeed, maybe you'll fail, but you made your life mean something because you tried. And even if you fail, you've still accomplished something. You've advanced things, for you've taught other people how to address the problem, and they can take up where you left off and maybe do better than you did. Besides, what are the backseat drivers and the armchair critics going to do with their lives if there isn't somebody beside them making mistakes? Living the Christian life is not primarily about success or failure anyway. That's what we think life is all about, success and failure. Maybe secular life is about that, but the Christian life is not about success and failure. It's primarily about growing spiritually. It's about growing closer to Christ. And making mistakes and failing are one of the chief ways that we grow spiritually and grow closer to Christ. The master who praised the slaves who had invested the money and made more money, I think he would have praised them just as much if they'd lost every cent of the money because it wasn't about making money, that wasn't the point. The point is taking a risk. Now I've taken a lot of risks in my life as a minister. 
especially in the blunt things that I've said in sermons and some of the things that I've done. And I've often been told that I was a reckless fool. How naive are you? Didn't you know that was all going to blow back on you? Well, of course I knew it might. Sometimes my risks produced good results. Sometimes they produced no results. In fact, it seems to me that most of the time it didn't produce anything. But God sees what I don't see. I don't know what's in other people's hearts. Maybe it accomplished more than I think it did. And other times, my risks produced bad results. Yet I've learned something valuable from every experience. I grew spiritually from every experience. I can also say that I tried to do something even when my attempt was not a particularly good one. I believe it is better to have tried and failed than to do nothing at all. It comes down to what you want your life to be and what you want your church to be. Do you want to avoid risk and accomplish nothing in life except to make your life comfortable and safe? Is that what you want out of your life? Or do you want to embrace risk, succeed and sometimes fail, sometimes accomplish nothing, but through it all to have served God's people and to have grown as his disciple? Amen.
Let us again come to the Lord in prayer. Creator God, how fearfully and wonderfully made are we. You gave us talents, you gave us minds to think, you gave us hearts to love, you gave us imaginations to create. We thank you for the immense potential you created in us. Teach us, inspire us to use it for good. Hear us now as we pray for your children everywhere. We pray for our neighbors in the United States. Guide their new president-elect to seek the good of all people, both in the United States and around the world. Hear us, O oh God. We pray for our world caught in this pandemic. Inspire us to find a way to end the suffering it is causing. Hear us, O oh God. We pray for your church throughout the world. Help it to be less risk averse and more willing to go out on a limb for the good of others. Hear us, O oh God. We pray for police forces throughout the world. Strengthen them in their valuable and essential service and give them wisdom and good judgment. Hear us, O oh God. We pray for hospitals throughout the world. Guide and strengthen those who work in them and show us how to appreciate them more. Hear us, O oh God. We pray for those who suffer from physical or mental illness. Heal them through the compassion of others. Hear us, O oh God. We pray for your creation, its air, its water, its land. Show us how to care for it with the same love you have as its creator. Hear us, O oh God. We pray for our enemies, those who have wronged us, those who do not respect us, and those who neglect us. Give us the strength to treat them with justice, respect, and compassion. Hear us, O oh God. We pray for those who are marginalized and cast out. By your spirit, do not let them falter. By that same spirit, teach others to include them. Hear us, O oh God. Now hear us as we pray silently the words that Christ taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Would you please stand? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.